society, a world filled with anxiety. This is society. This is society. This is society, a world filled with anxiety. This is society. This is society. This is society, a world filled with anxiety. This is society. This is society. This is society, a world filled with anxiety. War, terror, disease. There were a myriad of problems which conspired to corrupt your reason. Welcome to Freethinker Radio on KPFT. Glad to be here today, and uh, hope you enjoyed that song uh, by Worst Nightmare. Uh, love that intro. I forgot. Uh, uh, got some uh, quotes from a really good movie there. Worst Nightmare is going to be in the studio here in a little bit, probably around four o'clock, maybe four ten or so. We're talking to him about what's coming up for him. He's got a lot of exciting things, uh, a new release, and uh, uh, more. Okay, so let's see what else do I got to tell you about. I got a lot of housekeeping to do. We got that. Oh goodness, yeah, definitely. Got a Dr. Belt show coming up uh, this Friday. Y'all may remember them. You heard them at uh, for the community, and they were at a uh, little Dan Electro show of Visionary Noises just a couple of weeks back. So I'm gonna play a little bit of that, get things on track, and uh, get right back. Let's see. <laughs>
y'all are listening to Free Thinker Radio on KPFT HD3. And that was Dr. Belt. And actually, not just a show, but their album release will be taking place Friday at Alley Cat over on Main Street. So, down by Continental Club, if you don't know about it. I'm sure you can use Facebook and Google everything. If you made your way to HD3 to hear us, then I'm sure you're pretty tech savvy. So, I'll just leave that out there. And, of course... If you don't know our system, we uh, go ahead and we put all the articles that we source, as well as as much of the uh, links to guests, musicians, uh, whatever, in the event uh, for today's broadcast. And we will make an event for each uh, week. So we will be corresponding with you all through there. And as I said earlier, we kicked off with Worst Nightmare, who we will be speaking to later and uh, and uh, listening to a little Dr. Belt. Well, you know, we talk about the red lights here in Houston. Uh, Houston's not the only place with red light cameras. Um, and it turns out uh, there's um, kind of a little bit of an outcry against them in uh, Jersey Village. Um, anybody that knows anything about driving around Houston, you know to usually do what you can to avoid Jersey Village. Unless you got one of those special elite little JV stickers that you can buy as a resident and put it on your car, you can expect some special treatment, um, whatever that may mean. Uh, but anyway, nonetheless, uh, everyone in Jersey Village needs to know that the election to keep the right red light ca- scammers um, from coming back starts soon. Early voting starts April 25th through May 3rd, and the election day is May 7th. Um, this is charter election, similar to several cities, such as Houston. Um, but uh, this was basically forced on the ballot uh, by citizens of JV who signed a petition sufficient to force it on the ballot. So a lot of people have done work. Otherwise, it uh, would not even be there. City Council, in an attempt to make sure they can bring the scammers back and millions of dollars in fines, rolling in place their own proposition on the same ballot. Very confusing. You see, this is what they do, and this is why you have to read that ballot language very carefully. Because, yeah, they want you to accidentally commit to them. They don't care how you commit as long as you commit. And city council, well, you said this. uh, This is details on two propositions down there. So proposition one, a vote for proposition one will ban the cameras from being returned or installed in the future without a public vote. This is the proposition that was called for by the petition of citizenry to keep the scammers from ever coming back. So that's the people's proposition, Prop 1. Which, and Prop 2, a vote against Prop 2 would prevent the city from creating a loophole to keep the current cameras until 2024 and possibly longer. This is the one put up by the po- pro scamera city council to keep the money rolling in. If this one passes, it essentially nullifies Prop 1 even if it passes. That's right. Even if Prop 1 passes, banning cameras, an unlimited number of cameras could still be returned to Jersey Village for an unlimited amount of time. Yeah, see, see, that's how, that's how the, that's how the, you know, the, the, I guess you can't really call them scam artists, but they are really close to illusionists, right? Managed to get you to submit your ability to, how do you say it, have a voice in government? to them with just more and more tricks and funny writing. But yeah, so if you're in Jersey Village or know someone in Jersey Village or drive through Jersey Village, uh, y'all should know about that. And this event, there's an event for this because they want people to get after it, you know. We posted in the Facebook event, uh, and if you're looking for that Facebook event, you can either go to the Freethinker radio page and go to events, or you can just type in Freethinker Radio featuring Worst Nightmare because we'll be having... Worst nightmare on. And anyway, so moving on beyond Jersey Village. Yep, there's other things happening in the city. And I'm just going to talk about um, that. That sort of sounded like a news article. But really, it's news and an event because events are news, you know. Check it out. You know, everybody loves fits. Seems like these little uh, open mic singer-songwriter nights are starting to take off. It's a good chance for a lot of people to get to play fits that may not have played fits before. And it's a great place to hang out. So, you know, all the... Let's see what else is going on. The Bayou City Arts Festival. Um, oh, goodness. I forgot to tell you. I was going to tell you the day on that uh, Fitz Open Mic. Sorry, I dropped the ball on that one. That would be April 26th, tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, so what else was we talking about? Oh, yeah, the Bayou City Arts Festival. <laughs> Those people cannot get enough of arts. April 29th to May 1st, Memorial Park, Houston. Um, sounds fun. Good thing to get out. Sounds like a lot of people are going to get there. 
out of the 159 invited on Facebook, 2.2 thousand are interested and 334 are going. So, yeah, that looks like an interesting um, event with a lot of momentum behind it. And that one can be found as well as all these others. Um, also, uh, this one looks interesting. In addition to the Dr. Belt album release at Alley Cat, you can uh, check this one out. Uh, Black Lives Matter, Beyond the Hashtag. This is over at the, hosted by the TSU Hip Hop Society. Um, should be a fairly academic discussion. The College of Liberal Arts and Behavioral Sciences, in association with the TSU Hip Hop Society, presents Black Lives Matter, Beyond the Hashtag. Community leaders and activists discuss their experience in different movements and its failures and successes. Finally, they will discuss effective measures that we can implement today to bring about true change. So that's 5 p.m. Um, in the Public Affairs Building, room 114. Okay, so that one's there, too. Don't you, don't you just love living in a city where there's so much to do? Okay, what else is happening? Oh, and, um, you know, I was uh, kind of sad when I realized I let this event slip through my radar and ended up with other other things going on on the date so i'll be here hanging with all the houston people that are still here and want to come to my surprise party i'm pretty excited about but nonetheless april 30th is beyond just the surprise party if you're over there in austin or are going to go there the infamous eeyore's birthday party it'll be the, always the last saturday of april uh, it's the longest running free events in Austin. Uh, Eeyore's birthday party. Not only is it Eeyore, not only is Eeyore's birthday free, but it helps raise money for local nonprofits. And you can dig all into that in the event and just get through the history. It's a wonderful thing they have. I guess I don't know how to describe it. You know, you got Eeyore's proper. You know, down there with vendors and um, I don't know Eeyore himself. Yes, he's down there and. Uh, you know, music and different things like that, restrooms and stuff. And then all in the woods around there, you've just got people hanging out, listening, um, drum circles, just good, good, good mixing of people. So I'm sure you can figure all that out without me spelling it out. And, of course, I mentioned this surprise party. This is going to be here in Houston. So, you know, everybody that's staying back can have a good time, too. Um, and I'm trying to pull this one up right now. Everything's going slow, 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 slow. Okay. Well, there's more than one way to do this. And I want to remind you that if you have any comments, concerns, criticism, uh, articles, uh, bands, uh, poets, artists that we should know about, please message us at Freethinker Radio or just call us at 713-526-8737. We'll try to take your call. We're pretty busy here. Um, a lot of times we're looking for calls that we have scheduled. But we've had a few uh, call through that we we're really happy to hear their input. And, um, you know, I think our audience was as well. So let's keep it interactive. If you've got something to say, please either post it up in the Facebook uh, event page or uh, call in because we'd love to hear from you. I and mean, let me get back into this now that I finally got my computer to work. Surprise party. This is a surprise mix of musical acts starting around 4 or 5 on Saturday here at East Down Warehouse in downtown Houston. <coughs> Featuring Polly Swade, Virgil Wolf, The Northern Realm, Colin Hicks, D. Trey Val, Bill Trey, and John Black's going to be there. Yes, man. Uh, great new punk band. Uh, it's really getting a lot of attention. Crowded Isolation. Kino Sims, Kino Sims, Kino Sims, Kino Sims. That's right. Uh, the Field Trip, the Karaya Sato Revolution. If you haven't seen this guy, man, you don't know what you're missing. If you just like classic rock and straightforward blues rock and just inspired music, check him out. And 4902, Bulger Not. That's right. They had their uh, massively uh, attended uh, CD release with Ganesha and Funeral Horse last week, uh, or CD release, album release. And. Um, if you didn't make it, you didn't get it, you don't know what's up, you think that sounds like a good name, then go ahead and make it to East Town next Saturday, this Saturday, I should say. Because um, not only, oh, I forgot, there's just bands being added to this thing on the constant. Serpientes de Fuego will be there, and these guys bring it hard, go long, and just... So if you're going to, we run the gamut from some acoustic music to some electronic music to some varieties of hip hop and rap into just some uh, 
I guess you could call it kind of heavy psychedelic music into some uh, more like stoner rock and straight into some heavy metal towards the end. We're going to have some artists and uh, merchants out there. I want to remind everybody that these are people doing things too, just like the bands and KPFT and all these people who just believe they can do something. All these merchants and artists are the same way. Jelly Marez Art, uh, Morganics Gardens for All, Infinite Mind, Candles of Eden, Royal Tart, mm -hmm. uh, Mystic Shuffle. We got many sp supporters of this event, Red Publication, of course, KPFT, Astrozoa, Haffer Case, and JWS Instru Custom Instruments. It's really nice to see people that are creating instruments and cases for instruments, taking an interest in shows, you know, because, uh, you know, the people are using instruments there. But, you know, we have a diverse community, and we have a lot of resources here, and I think that's the point of uh, some of this, you know. And if you're, if you're hiding on the couch, you don't get out enough, you know, maybe you just haven't made the connect yet. I hope some of these events... Uh, interest you and um, you can make it to them all right i think i want to take a little bit of a break from talking and uh, play a little bit of music and uh, get right back with you with the news if you got anything to say 713-526-8737 what y'all want you want a little bit more dr belt i'll give you one more dr belt and hope y'all enjoy it because it's coming
All right, y'all are listening to Freethinker Radio. That was as Dusk Falls. They're a, uh, I guess, a East Texas band that uh, just rocks and gives sentiment to different feelings and such. And uh, I uh, hope that if you like any of the music that we're sharing here, that you'll go ahead and like their page and uh, um, do something with those bands. I got one uh, event that I left off that uh, I wanted to go ahead and mention, and this is a... Uh, um, it's a bit of an event, to say the least. Lawndale Art Center is uh, presenting Speakeasy. It's a new program initiative that re-envisions Lawndale Speakeasy series that took place uh, from 93 to 2002. This series will cast a reflexive eye on Lawndale's historical relationship to live performance and the exploration of issues in contemporary art. Scheduled for this Friday um, at 7 p.m., um, See, David Dove, I uh, want to talk about this. For almost 10 years, he, he'll be there. But for almost 10 years, trumpeter, rapper, producer, uh, Jar Wood, Taylor, and uh, trombone player David Dove have created music that seeks the, the plasticity and responsiveness of free improvisation while maintaining the integrity of its influence. Trombone, pitch down, creeping slow, sub from subwoofers, live electronics, and the freest of freestyle emceeing are among the many layers that uh, construct long-form and widely dynamic spontaneous music. Um, for their first Houston appearance in nine years, uh, Sharalam Bides, Sharalam Bides uh, will stretch and explore compositions uh, featured on recent uh, releases by the band and singer-writer Christina Carter. Uh, their performances oscillate between the poles of charged pin drop silence and layered guitar roar, often in the course of the same song. So this should be a pretty interesting, uh, reflexive event that also includes some, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, great music, uh, some some uh, well-known artists. So I wanted to make sure I got that one out. And how you doing, Derek? I'm doing good, man. It's uh, Sorry I got here a little bit late, guys. Hope all of you are doing well. It's uh, another beautiful month. Almost what April? April's about to conclude. I'm having a good weekend. I uh, went out of town to check out the Seed Transformational Festival. It's pretty cool. Saw some friends out there. Maybe some of you guys are listening. It was a first time event. Um, it gave me some ideas for some future projects we can do, as far as for the community and visionary noise events outside of Houston, like on land and stuff. It was a uh, in Goliad, Texas. Um, I think it's been the site of another festival before called Blestonia or something like that. But it was a cool property. They, they actually, the the owners have about 5,000 acres out there. But the property that they used for the festival, which was four different stages, was on like about 200 acres. So it was really spread out, camping and um, different things like that. They had some workshops on like yoga and uh, there was a med- couple meditations. And I gave a short talk and um, there was all kinds of different music. I actually, I found definitely some musicians that I want to play here on uh, on on our, our radio show as well as book Inside Houston. Because there was bands from Austin. A lot of it was... The stages were all different, which is cool. Like, you know, you had the electronic, um, which you would expect for kind of like a, um electronic outdoor festival, loud bass, and, which is awesome. And then this other stage, though, which was the tree stage, which was pretty cool. It was, you know, made, and, like, the base of it had all these branches and trees attached to it, and there was big trees overhanging the top of it. So it was a really cool stage. They had um, jazz, funk, you know, all kinds of, like, flamenco, like a lot of different artists. So there was, And that was where... I was posted up for the most part with some of uh, friends of Visionary Noise, Rosie, who uh, runs Lorena Vigana, um, who's worked at uh, for the community before, and just provides awesome, good, wholesome, organic, uh, vegetarian, and vegan food at various events. And so I hung out with them and saw some other friends, got to do my talk, met new people, talk about my book, and um, yeah, so that was a good time. <coughs> and uh, this Thursday, I want to remind you guys, for those who are interested, just a little bit of self-promotion here for a moment. Um, I have a book release event Thursday night at Midtown Bar and Grill in Montrose off West Gray, 415 West Gray, I think. And um, that's about 730 upstairs. I'll be talking about and reading from my new book, which is called Finding Freedom in an Age of Confusion. It was co-written by me and John Vibes, who's a writer out of uh, Maryland. And, uh, you know, some essays on just empowerment, trying to give people tools to uh, get past the anger and the depression and you know confusion that can come along with questioning you know the nature of reality, government, authority itself, and just l- focus on solutions and building up that empowerment, really pushing home that message that you are not alone. So we'll be talking about that as well as sort of announcing and discussing uh, this this new project um, that some people within the Houston Freethinkers and this Houston Freedom Cell idea that we've been exploring are hoping to get some land by the end of this year, at the beginning of 2017, and try to start an intentional community uh, built around sustainability, you know, the non-aggression 
um, axiom, you know, individuality, just different ideas and really just starting to explore that and throw it out to the public and see who's interested and who wants to be involved in that, who wants to, you know, possibly invest or volunteer, et cetera. Nothing's set in stone at this point, just some people who are interested in talking about more. So we'll be talking about that as well Thursday night, my book release, and a discussion on building an intentional community outside of Houston, somewhere within, you know, the Houston area, maybe an hour, two hours outside of the city, um, but not too far. So that's Thursday night at Midtown Bar and Grill. That's what I'll be up to. And other than that, I was not here last week. I know we had a short check-in show because there was some confusion. And the week before that, we thought we were the only show. We thought we were broadcasting, and then there was some problems with the HD3 dial. So uh, about two weeks ago, we had a, a show. Um, and this, I guess, will start segueing into local stuff. Uh, we had a show that we talked about. I really wish we would have got it recorded because it was a great show. We had Johnny call in from North Houston Freethinkers. Um, we had uh, Jake from Versa Nova call in. Um, and then Vax. Vax. Oh, yeah. And then we had um, the this lady, Catherine Masha, who's one of the organizers of this uh, Va- Houston-censored protest that happened a couple weeks ago related to the documentary Vax um, from Controversy to Catastrophe is the full name of it. And it was originally slated <coughs> to open at the, uh, the uh, Tribeca Film Festival, which is co-founded by Robert De Niro and some other people. And then it was at the last minute pooled, causing some controversy. Then it was supposed to premiere at the Houston International Film Festival. And then... The mayor's office reportedly intervened, and it was pulled again. And you know, we did. We talked with Catherine. We did some uh, some more research, and I just wanted to provide some updates, mainly since you guys didn't get to hear the interview. But if you don't know much about it, we'll post the links. We're posting the links. Uh, I think we've got a thread going. If you're on Facebook, there's a Houston uh, Freethinker Radio Facebook event for today. We'll post the articles in there. All the links to you. We'll start a thread there. Um, and I have a art- I started one. Cool, we got one going already. I'll add to that. I'll add uh, the Houston Vaxxed uh, article I wrote a couple weeks ago because I interviewed the mayor's office officials. I called the uh, Hunter Todd, the head of the film festival, and I called the di- distributor of the film itself, Cinema Libre, and we got you know comments from all of them and basically confirmed that this leaked email that said that Hunter Todd was, he, in his words, he said, threatened by two high-up government officials uh, for within the mayor's office, Houston government officials, Uh, about this and you know he was telling uh, Felipe Diaz with Cinema Libre I hope that you weren't threatened as well you know this is just disturbing they haven't called my office in 49 years and when I talked to him he sort of laughed it off the first time and you know and just it it, it bothered me so after writing the story I was like you know what let me call him one more time and then a couple days later and I was just was like hey I want to reach out to you again and give you an opportunity to update you know your story or maybe to respond because when I first talked to you you sort of laughed it off and said oh it was just some nice lady from the uh, mayor's office, nothing to worry about. But this email here says that, you know, you were threatened. Do you care to comment on that? And then he told me at first he was kind of forceful, and he said that I think that that email was cut. You know, that was uh, it, somebody apparently edited it together and put it out on the Internet. But I had already confirmed with the recipient of the email that it was, in fact, you know, the real email. So he was, um, you know, not willing, not interested in, in talking more about that. So I kind of backed off, and, and then um, he, he – and I'm just sharing this for the public, you know, I put it on the record – I believe in transparency, because um, I think this Hunter Todd uh, fellow is—he definitely said he supports KPFT. He supports what we're doing. Um, he seems, you know, kind of adamant. He's like, you know, we, out of all the questions I've had, you know, this film festival we've been dealing with it, none of them have been related to Vax. It's not going to show, so it's not going to win win an award. I don't know why we're talking about it. As far as we're concerned, it's a dead issue. And then when I told him, well, actually, it's not a dead issue. Dead issue. There's about you know 50 plus women downtown uh, at City Hall protesting right now. And they're about to go into the city council and talk to the mayor and whatever. And he's like, are you serious? And his tone changed. And um, he became a lot more open to communicating. And, um, you know, all I really want to say beyond that is I do think that there's some support within um, that film festival. And that, um, from what I can tell, that it is pretty plausible that somebody definitely within the mayor's office, not just some nice young lady from the Office of Cultural Affairs, but maybe his original statement is closer to fact than he's now willing to admit. Because, like he said, he thought it was a private email. Somebody leaked it somehow. And, you know, I understand that. You don't necessarily think everything you're saying in private conversations is going to come out. But when you are uh, you get put in the public spot like that, uh, I guess it's time to sort of open up and be honest about what was going on. But that's just some more information on that situation. Um, we haven't seen the documentary ourselves. He, I will say that Hunter Todd did tell me this. He said, I wish the mayor's office would go see it. They offered to show it to them. They haven't even seen it yet. And he was sort of upset or laughing that he was like, they haven't seen it and they're they're talking down on it. Now, from his words, he said he thinks it's a worthy documentary that all people should see and that it, you know, it asks some serious questions. And if we want to have Houstonians informed, because the mayor said he didn't want to use taxpayer money 
or, or the city's money, which is the taxpayer money, to um, question vaccinations since they also have a health department that promotes vaccinations. But I think if you want an informed public and populace to make their own mind how they treat their children, then, you know, you should have the right information available to, uh, you know, to, to communicate that. You should have the ability to get that information out there. All that's true. The I think there's some additional difficulties here when you have a government that, uh, whether it's city, state, whatever, that becomes involved in the economics like this. Because does the city of Houston make films? Not really. Does the city <laughs> of Houston, you know, uh, run a mechanism whereby they promote films? Well, now that we have this uh, film festival, they're getting their hand in it as much as possible. But then what happens is... It becomes dirtied because, see, all of a sudden, the money that the city is giving to this becomes what determines what film is. And I don't know that that's, you know, uh, the best situation. So when, when, when government gets involved in different industries, it is inevitably going to create some sort of conflict of interest like this, where they're going to, uh, you know, because the government's got their hand in so many different things there's going to be a conflict of interest because they're going to have one hand over here doing this oh we can't we're getting money from big pharma and you know we're making the people believe that they're better off and here's this proof that they are better off and you know this is our white knight you know that (laughs) argument here that we're going to you know do better you know save children stop all these plagues so we can't show that side we can't keep our open-minded artistic freedom and still do that so, see, I think it's more, you know, people talk about it being censorship, and I get that, but that's what happens when you get government up involved yeah, in your exactly. arts. Yeah, I agree. And that's sort of the unfortunate uh, side effect, I guess you could say, of, of that intersection and the, the further continuing to look to government for answers. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean that that there there are not good things that we can point to and say, okay, well, government action using taxpayer-funded money, of course, which is theft from, you know... Well, you know, if you get enough money, enough effort behind something, honestly, you're going to do good if, like, that's what your argument is. You have to, you know, like, you have to produce the the product you sold to your customer, at least some semblance of it. And yeah. you're selling all these things to the American people, really. I definitely don't consider myself to be a customer of the IRS or of this, uh, of this government itself, but um, that's probably another conversation. Um, we we got into that a little bit recently online. There was some discussion about <laughs> about uh, whether or not the IRS actually has customers or not. Well, they used to say so on their um, answer machine. They used to say, you know, who are currently bus- busy except or helping other customers, as if we were volunteers. Absolutely, we're not volunteering. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I didn't. I never volunteered to pay for uh, war or for other things that I don't support. And I, apparently, I don't have the option to where that money goes. So um, it's not. It's not a voluntary, consensual relationship. You mean you got taxation without representation? Uh, I do indeed have. Feel very. I feel unrepresented. Unrepresented. I feel <laughs> taxed. Taxed. I feel scared. They're going to yeah. come after me if Speaking I don't. Speaking of scared, you might need to be. Another man is suing uh, her- the city of Houston and police officers, uh, saying his uh, rights were um, violated. Um, it turns out that this gentleman. Uh, filed a lawsuit um, in the middle of April on uh, Southern District of Texas against City of Houston and one, two, three, four police officers. I try not to say their names so much because I really don't think the particulars matter. Alleging they used, a, at least on these, we're talking about a higher level thing, like a uh, systemic problem. Alleging they had used uh, excessive force when attempting to arrest the plaintiff. According to the complaint on April 16th, Roberts received uh, multiple injuries. Um, some life-threatening when he was arrested. Plaintiff alleges the police used excessive force, deliberately ran him over twice, despite clear indications he had never attempted to resist arrest. Suit says that plaintiff suffered severe injuries, some which could be permanent and a lifetime of pain and suffering. He also sustained a medical ex- uh, me- he also sustained medical expenses and loss of earning capacity. Uh, Robert seeks trial by jury, all damages, interest, legal fees, and any other relief the uh, court deems just. Uh, represented by Madden and Lee, both of Houston, uh, of uh, Harris County. Uh, and the gentleman's name that suffered this is uh, Joseph D. Roberts. So um, let's see. You know, that's a that's something. I, I there's a uh, there's a uh, another lawsuit out. Um, uh, that's one of them, and uh, there's another one up in Hitchcock. Uh, it, it's starting to add up, you know. I mean, today we saw that that $6 million uh, was uh, awarded up in, uh, was it Chicago, for Tamir Rice's family. 
So, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe enough lawsuits and enough paying, I guess, you know, taxpayer and other funds out for violating these things. Maybe some municipalities will, you know, get the message. It turns out, like, on this particular story about Hitchcock, it's real interesting because this gentleman, Larry Gaston, uh, re- initiated legal action uh, against the city of Hitchcock uh, in Galveston County, um, the mayor and the chief of police. Uh, turns out that a police officer and several unnamed individuals on April 14th in Galveston County uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, court papers show that the three police officers in, uh, went to Gaston's home on the morning of April 5th and questioned him about water service. Per the complaint, Jenkins, uh, sp- the police officer spoke to Gaston with an angry tone. Officer Jenkins made angry statements to the plaintiff to the effect of, we are going to clean this city up, and don't you know who I am? The original petition says... <laughs> and those are knocking people over words. After the plaintiff directly uh, questioned why Officer Jenkins was so agitated, Officer Jenkins ordered one of the junior police officers, Take him! Authorities allegedly did not inform Gaston of why he was being taken, nor read him his rights. Gaston, you know, they just showed up, started yelling at him, clean up the city. <laughs> Gaston was held in the Hitchcock City Jail. Uh, according to the suit, the city did not did not have an ordinance that made not having city utilities illegal. So he was basically arrested because he didn't have city utilities. But it turns out that that's not even a crime, much less an offense leading to arrest. Hitchcock official, you know, because you could, you you know, like when you get pulled over, that's the crime, but you are not going to get arrested for a failure to signal. You'll get a ticket. Hitchcock officials uh, purportedly promised the plaintiff that he could not face any charges if he just complied. You know, go along. Yep. And uh, despite, even though he adhered to the request, uh, the original uh, petition states he was arrested again. Uh, uh, Consequently, he seeks unspecified monetary damages and a jury trial. And it turns out that the uh, officers, uh, or excuse me, Attorney Freed Houston um, in Austin is going to represent that one. And there's another one. Yes, there's more. This is just in Texas, you know. I mean, dang. People suing and getting stepped on and uh, ran over and <laughs> arrested for not having utilities. <laughs> Take them. <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, they that city probably couldn't. They probably had some sort of deal kind of like that thing with the uh, festival, you know, where, you know, they had to sell you some city utilities. <laughs> we can't. We're cleaning up the city. Can't have room for miscreants without city utilities. Got to be on the city drip. And I wanted to read this thing about uh, uh, I read the story earlier some sisters are suing uh, uh claiming that their father sustained severe injuries in uh um well in uh Pasadena police department custody but my computer's just spinning so I can't get too much into it but it turns out that I think he he was an elderly gentleman um what I remember from the story is that he could uh he he was intoxicated when he was arrested and he uh how do you put it uh he basically couldn't operate his jail suit and he ended up hurting himself in the sale. He's a very old man. And he laid there on the floor screaming. And uh, when they went to see what was up, they told him if he couldn't, if they couldn't understand him, they couldn't help him. So nobody went to see that his legs were broken and all this other stuff. So, yeah, there's things that are happening up in them jails. That doesn't sound familiar. Change? Change? What, are they going to give us a camera in the beat-down room? It's interesting, too, because it's... It's meant to... I don't know if they can hear me. It's meant to, to keep people from being able to use the Internet while they're they're locked up, basically, is what it, it's worried about. Because in prison, um, in all kinds of jail uh, you know institutions, it's not that difficult to sneak in, a, sneak in a cell phone. People do it, and don't ask me how they do it. You probably don't want to know. But... They get cell phones, but in it there. still works. It works, <laughs> and it's uh, you know, it's it's obviously it's a hot commodity when you're locked up to have access to a cell phone because it's a smartphone. You can get online. You can get out. You know, you can also make connections with people out outside. Whether that's just you know, and also because when you're locked up, it's a pain in the ass to use the phone. It costs money for your family. You know, to have these calls. So if you got a cell phone that you can use for free and just call your family real quick and hey, what's up? Can you send money? This or that? Whatever. It's very helpful. But people, you know, of course, they're going to use it for whatever they want to. Um, and I think this is what this is aimed about because also people will have, like, they'll create social media accounts or they'll keep updating their accounts while they're locked up using some, like, phones. So I think this is what it's aimed at is trying to stop those phones. 
But as of last week, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice is getting in the digital censorship game with a new policy that would punish an offender for having a social media pre- presence, even when someone on the outside is posting updates on their behalf. This is crazy. It stops. It makes it illegal for a third party to do it as well. Uh, as reported by Fusion, Texas's new offender manual creates a prohibition on inmates, quote, maintaining active social media accounts for the purposes of solicit- soliciting, updating, or engaging others through a third party or otherwise. The rule flies in the face of free expression by penalizing offenders not only for their own use of social media, but also when their friends and family on the outside maintain their social media accounts to draw attention to prisoner issues, writes the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So that's another thing is they don't want, you know, high profile prisoners to have social media accounts where they're like saying, hey, you know, the, the they beat me down and rectal feet me. Yeah, they're beating us down here. The <laughs> conditions are bad. Or, you know, the Internet has revolutionized the world in a lot of ways. Obviously, prisoners have access now to the Internet by saying, hey, I'm in this prison and they're locking us down or whatever, you know, and they do what they can to stop that by finding these, uh, you know, these these jail phones and stuff. But obviously they can't really uh, stop it completely. So I think this new rule for Texas is aimed at that. The EFF says. We do not oppose prison restrictions that target criminal behavior or harassment on social media by inmates. However, a person does not lose all of the rights to participate in su- public discourse when they are incarcerated. Supporters of inmates often use social media to raise attention about prison conditions and the appeal campaigns of individual prisoners. This policy would not only prohibit the prisoners' exercise of their First Amendment rights, but also prevent the public from exercising their First Amendment rights to gather information about the criminal justice system from those most affected by it. If Martin Luther King Jr. had written a letter from a Birmingham jail today from a Texas prison, this policy would prohibit his wife from publishing it on his social media accounts. Uh-huh. As the Electronic Frontier Foundation previously reported, policies like this have been abused by prisons across the country, most notably in South Carolina, where inmates sometimes receive more than a decade in solitary confinement for maintaining a presence on social media. And the EFF calls on Texas to reverse the policy and for social media providers, particularly Facebook, which previously automatically suspended inmate accounts at the request of prisons to resist this censorship game. So it's pretty crazy. I think that's, I mean, obviously, when you get locked up in prison, most people, they don't give, you know, they don't give a crap about you anymore. They're like, oh, you, you must have done something wrong. There's something wrong with you. You, you uh, committed some crimes. Um, you know, but you're still a person, and I think that's, that's important to note because I've been uh, in the criminal justice system in Texas and, you know, a but lot you're of, not a person anymore. A lot of people do. I mean, uh, the truth is that a lot one. of people treat you that way. They'll say like, oh, well, you, you know, well, obviously they did something to get in there. So now they want to cry, you know, whenever they don't get good conditions or whatever. But if there's good conditions, you mean just normal, just like humane, civil, yeah. <laughs> you know, not being abused. And what this does, it's just crazy that they go beyond instead of just penalizing the person that's in prison, but saying it's illegal for a third party, your significant other, your family, et cetera, to also post for you. I mean, well, I think the analogy you just uh, made to a uh, letter from a Birmingham jail, how that wouldn't have been out, uh, you know, in, in this dracon- with this draconian law in effect. And and other things, too. I mean, uh, look how many things have been written from prison here in Texas. I mean, Stephen F. Austin's uh, letter uh, uh, from a jail in Mexico created a revolution that broke two states rebelled, not just Texas. So, you know, these things that are written. And what about, you know, the Christians out there where John's writing all that stuff and he's in uh, prison in Patmos. So you all want to anybody who supports uh, quieting a voice just because they're in prison misses misses what, uh, uh, I guess, uh, rights really are. Word. I got one more I want to do about Texas before we go to some music and bring on our guest. Um, this is also something that happened last weekend in Eagle Pass, Texas, which is a little bit closer to the border. Saturday, April 16th, about 150 activists marched from Independence Bridge on the Texas-Mexico border to the front of the Dos Republicas coal mine. Many of the protesters were native, representing the Texas Lipin Apaches, the Pacuche Band of Nation. I, mean, I can't say all these names. I apologize. The um, Kickapoos and various chapters of the American Indian Movement. The groups called on the Army Corps of Engineers to rescind the mines permit and halt the destruction of their ancestral land. So this is, as I said, it's an e- a few miles outside of Eagle Pass near the border here in Texas and Mexico. And there's some really awesome pictures. I'm going to post this in the thread with the other articles. But the protesters are saying that according to a federal law, the mine that is planned here that has recently started, uh, you know, they started digging it, that the local community should have been um, consulted before it was completed. According to the National Historic Preservation Act, which states that you must consult with involved tribes when historical or cultural sites are concerned, it's mandatory. Um, Maria Torres says that no effort was made to consult with the tribes, none at all. 
And according to an archaeological survey conducted in 1992, 11 sites within the, the mine's permit area are, quote, eligible for designation as a state archaeological landmark and or eligibility for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, Fusion also reports that Dos Republica, Republica's mine permit application submitted to the Railroad Commission in 2008 lists over 70 different cultural resource sites within the proposed impact area. And the plan calls for turning prehistoric campsites and artifacts into drainage sites and uh, sites of railway r tracks. So they're just literally taking areas that have been uh, sacred and important to various tribes in this area. In uh, I don't even really like calling it Texas because these are people, and this is where my family comes from, people have been in this place that we now call Texas since before Texas exist existed and before... the. And before, Earth. And, and before the <laughs> Spanish came and, you know, as well and, and colonized there. And it's just, uh, but yeah, so they're down there. And these, these people have been there for a long time, their communities, their families. And there's also some environmental uh, concerns. Brian Paros, who's a, a community health worker here in Houston, he's founder of the Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Service, Tejas. He was present at the march. And he said that, quote, I stand with my native Texans and believe that this ground should not be disturbed as our first inhabitants are buried in these grounds and should not be removed. This area is home to our sacred medicine and several endangered species. As I said, this is a site of a former uh, graveyard that now they're going to turn into a drainage site. They're going to turn into all sorts of things for this mine. Um, and this open pit mine, just a little bit more about it, it's owned by Dos Republicas Coal Partnership. It first started operating in late 2015. So they have to take this low-grade low coal, rip it from the earth at uh, this 600, 346 acre mine, and ship it to train by Mexico, where it is burned in coal-fired power plants in... Uh, Mexico, about half hour south of the border, and what's interesting is the quality of the coal that's going to be burned in Mexico. To, you know, in on that side of the border, is too dirty for U.S. standards. But since they don't have those standards in Mexico, the communities over there, unfortunately, are going to suffer uh, as well. So this is screwing over people on both sides of the border and these native communities. And um, I imagine the people who've had their land uh, taken in order to to build this but of course they promise this is going to create a million dollars uh, a year to the local economy and create new jobs they promise they will last a long long time and this won't damage the earth and it'll be worth it time. we love you long time let us dig in your ground let us dig up the earth please Take your sacred medicine but thankfully people like brian and others are out there fighting if you want to learn more about that look into texas aim the american indian movement check out some of the chapters in the houston area you find out more about some of their actions and what they got going on we're going to go to a song now, and then we're going to come back with our guest, Jesse. Uh, what we got coming on, Michael? We're going to jam. We're going to uh, jam some Worst Nightmare as soon as I filter through and find one, one that we are actually the, permitted to the play. the FCC says we can play? Yeah, and yeah, we know what FCC stands for. Yeah, Jesse's got a dirty mouth. Dirty, <laughs> dirty potty mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what are we going to hear here? We're going to listen to uh, Heavy Blue by Worst Nightmare. Yep. Um, and with, uh, with hummus. So, uh, oh, Heavy Blue. Anyway. Um, Y'all get into this. We'll be back on. He'll tell us everything he's got going on, and uh, that'll be very enjoyable to hear. So dig it. You can find it on SoundCloud if you like it. That's terrible. What's wrong, Chuck? That's a terrible idea. A two dollars. Pathetic waste is what's capturing kids babbling in free format, call it chivalry tips. Relevance is irrelevant, like a genius with a speech impediment, or humans eating excrement. My TV's love is negligent. After I'm dead, these pack rappers will buy CDs off my skeleton. Matando todos los MCs, con mi mente, gente no puede ni ver mi frente. Escribimos palabras que inventan, se es tiempo que ustedes se sientan. To mention the ladders render you helpless, descending lead to no gates, rest to your fate. God forbid you have to wait for the rain, meet the stars again and equate. Try to relate and try to debate. Know that this premature time is just a conscious mistake. You'd be better off hopping afraid than scoffing your mate. Like you're saying, I'm hiding out in an office for days. Cause misery stays with crime fairy usually pays. We still in the bays looking for the dot, and that's mysterious to a lot. A mic cables a constant knot. Deep fried fables in a cosmic slop. Ironic cause, cause I, I kinda, kinda cop. Constantly in chronic crop. 
Again, our infinite thoughts thicken the plot. Shaking the tree. Stop and smell what arose, ponder elusive quandary. Surety feeds on seconds timed. Not with a flag in the sun, nor a monument in the sea. Shredding skin to expand, watered in crevices. Death eternity. Water weight, save my soul, leave it blank. Cosmos freckled mustard seeds as far as the eye could let escape. You don't have to take courage, trees point like veins. All right, welcome back to Freethinker Radio. I'm here with uh, Worst Nightmare. How how are you, man? I'm I'm doing awesome. My voice is kind of a little jacked up from last night's show, but oh I'm, yeah, over at Dan's, I saw that. Man. It was actually really fun. So y'all went pretty hard out there. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was pretty pretty intense. So uh, I kind of murdered the intro on that song. You want to tell us a little bit about that one we were just listening to? Uh, the one with uh, my boy with, Heavy Blue. Yeah. Um, when I started when I started doing hip hop. Um, I heard him. I've known him since he was 13. I heard him on an internet radio show as well. Nice. Uh, and I didn't know that he had started rapping. So I started hanging out with him and I booked him here in Houston. And this cat, after I booked him in Houston one time, he was like, okay, whatever. I'm picking up my backpack from San Antonio and I'm moving here with nothing. Well, that's good to hear. You know, I hear a lot of uh, people that say, you know, because sometimes in Houston we hear a lot about, you know, maybe suburban kids or something. You got to go to Austin. You got to go to Seattle. You got to go here and there. But we, the musicians that we have come through, a lot of them are like, hey, man, this is more live than what we got going on. And, you know, we're just over here. So we got that outside perspective and we're thinking everything's exactly. grand over there. But hearing it from the people on the street. It's always good. Oh, yeah. No, we got something special here in H-Town. Yeah, but uh, we, we wrote that song. I, we actually wrote that song in San Antonio. I went to go visit him and just hang out. Um, and this was, this was the first time we ever collaborated with each other. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to work out, you know. But as soon as we got there, we started writing, and it was just like magic. It was just it just kind of all flowed together. And after that, I started hanging out with him a lot. He goes as heavy the bluebird now, but... Yeah, I wondered when you said that Heavy the Blue, I was like, wait, I know Heavy the Bluebird, Chris. Yeah, he used to be Heavy Blue, now he's Heavy the Bluebird. Makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. I wondered if it was the same person. So, uh, what do you got coming up? I know you've uh, got a lot of exciting things. I got, I've seen I, them in the feed. Yeah, I've, I've gotten a lot of gotten a lot of good feedback on like a bunch of new stuff, and I have um, I have songs coming out with a lot of Houston rappers. I'm going to be on a couple of mixtapes with people. Um, I'm also in talks with. You know, a major manager, like major artist manager, which is kind of weird for me because, you know, I'm, I've always been DIY, very, very underground. Um, so I'm not going to, you know, let them take my essence from it. But, you know, it, it would be really cool to make it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all need uh, I, I, I in in the end of the day, I understand a lot of artists and I understand the sentiment. Like if the art or the work's good enough, it'll find a home. But at the same time, you know, we got to find if you're not going to not not that you don't, because I know you're out there also. But some people aren't on the street. They're in the lab, you know, constantly creating yeah. songs and thinking that that's somehow going to break it. But we got to find out, you know, who what are resources to us? You know, like KPFT is and getting the word out about this, you know, this this um, and some managers, you know, you know, after a while you get to learn what is a service to you, you know, and. And uh, to sit around and wait to make it, that's just too much, you know. So, like you said, this is a DIY approach, even though you might not see yeah, it Yeah, like way. my first... You're finding this guy. My whole first EP was just recorded off of a cell phone microphone um, and just a lot of weird mixing between putting all these files into the computer and then kind of making them a little bit crisp. But it's it was really weird at first. And I, that's why I'm really surprised why I've been getting more and more popular because... All of my music was like really, really bad quality when I first came out. Just really bad. I was uh I was watching an interview with Atlantic uh Records founders and uh 
they were talking, you know, it seems so beyond anything we're talking here, right? But uh, they were talking about how embarrassed they were from some of the first Atlantic recordings oh, yeah. because they were just, they wouldn't even mic everything. They just throw a mic in the room, record it, and yeah. get it out there because there's something to be said for that. What are you going to do? Wait for the people to find it? And I was talking to a guy who's coming to uh, the show Saturday, and he had a couple of, it was rap, he has a couple other rappers that uh, um, spoke for him. But he doesn't have any recorded music out there. So even if he had, like, some chopped up uh, just, you know, on a phone, it would be something out there so people can start. you got to start somewhere. And, you know, I understand after you've been doing it for a while, you might want to put up something with a little bit more quality because you don't want to be stuck in that mode yeah, where people course. are like, okay, we, you know, because you see these cell phone videos from a show or something, yeah. and then you see an artist maybe put that on their main page, and it's kind of like it shows that they've only hit a certain level of, right. uh, of ability to draw either support or... Or their own uh, machine to give them. I know, just kind of got tired of like not being able to play music because I couldn't find like yeah. the people to do it with. So I, one thing I'd really noticed is that I loved hip hop from the beginning since I was a little kid. So I figured, hey, you know, why not just do it? Like, it's, there's nothing holding me back. I from think it. that sentiment is one that I hear resound with a number of artists who just say, "I'm not waiting." I've even heard visual artists they they wanted art on their walls, but they didn't want to go buy a bunch of it, so they just started making it. And yeah. you know, um, some of these people have gone on to do things, and I I'm I'm always impressed by that. And I think that's you know kind of the sentiment with anybody that's DIY. They're just like not going to wait any longer. Like let's see what can happen. And in that, that's where the innovation happens. In that, you know, that's where the real life and you know. Just I was just super surprised that um, people were going to get into my music because the first show I played was at the Firehouse, and it was when I first met Days and Days back in the day when, like, none of us were doing anything big. We were just trying to get a show, and I don't know, that day, it was, it was pretty packed show, and it was my first show ever as a hip-hop artist, so I was, like, really nervous, but people liked it, and even though it was bad quality, like, people actually liked it, so I was really happy about it. Is, and I've been happy about it. I, the, the music that I come out with is a little more better quality sometimes, but, you know, like, I still keep my DIY thing going on. I still have some songs that sound, like, a little a little crustier than most. Jesse, I just want to ask you, like, what do you use? Like, what do you create with? Like, how, how I record my music? Yeah, like, what do you, what kind well, of, you know, equipment? Well, whenever I first started, what I did is I would record everything on a cell phone and these files weren't even mp3 files or anything i would have to send them over to my email and then convert them and then go on audacity and get the beat laid out so you create beats on audacity oh and, uh, I, I i suck at making beats like i have i have friends who like my cousin from mexico he's in this thing called um man what is it called i can't remember but they're like a, uh, it's called nafi and they're for, they're all from mexico city and like and like all of mexico and they're all djs and producers and stuff so a lot of the beats have been produced by friends and stuff because i i have the patience to sit there and write you like a million songs but i do not have the patience to sit there and make a beat like it's, it's like really hard for me i've tried but it's like i made like 15 seconds of a beat and trashed it every single time because i was just like this is not good <laughs> So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a really good writer. Like, I love writing music. Like, for nine minutes, of course, like, I still, I'm still writing songs for that because we might be coming back and we have some people interested. So, I you know, I just like, I like writing. <laughs> you mentioned uh, nine minutes, and I think this is interesting. I wasn't going to go there, but uh, I uh, think, I, you know, obviously I know nine minutes. This is a, if you don't know, they're a metalcore band or whatever you want to call it, you know, just loud, uh, very... Uh, uh, Angry stuff. <laughs> some angry stuff and some very musically proficient stuff. Some amazing guitar work. and um, Those guys are really talented. Like. But it's a, the, the point I want to get to is you know that uh, it's radically different from what you do with Worst Nightmare oh, in some ways. You know, I, always, style of music. I always get like the weirdest looks everywhere I go because I show up to a hip-hop show with a freaking uh, like vest that's all patched out. And I get on stage and people are like, what is this guy doing on stage? And then I start rapping and, and it was like, what? what and then i go and you know i'm in a power violence band too so it's like super just punk rock and then i do nine minutes so like it's just kind of funny seeing people's reactions to whenever i switch from spectrum to spectrum on that it's well, really funny i think it's a really good and healthy thing to do because you know i know some people get very stagnant but i i, I bet if i go look at your music collection it's diverse. Oh, I, I, I love all of all music. I mean, except for like polka and country. Yeah, yeah. You just <laughs> but, probably ain't found what it is there yet. If it is, yeah, it ain't worth digging. <laughs> yeah, I, I really got, I really got most of my like all the all musical taste from my parents because they were like 
you know, there were like crust punks in Mexico City. So like my whole life, I've just been surrounded by like just people who love music and love playing music. And everyone was in really like, I know for a fact that my aunt, my mom's boyfriends were like in this one band, like Masacres in Tayocho or something like that. And they were like a really, really, really big band in Mexico. And I didn't know that, but I knew those, I knew those guys because they, they were my, my parents, you know what I'm saying? Like my nice family's friends well you know you're talking and, and, and lately this theme's just kind of been echoing around in my head a little bit and you know it's been this way for maybe 10 or more years but so much more capability is in the individual musician's hands um, um so much uh, more diverse uh, ability to create as you were saying you know the nine minutes is so radically or so different and then the third band is different from your rap work um, but and people aren't simple like they used to be. We have so many different media channels coming at us, so we're soaking up whatever connects to us in different ways. The people that are open, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people that, are, like I said, stagnate and close. So it's almost you know it's it's a renaissance of stuff because people are creating all this varied work, art, and even some of these merchants with like jewelry art and as well as musical artists and um, uh, and there's so many different ways to get it out there that in a way. <laughs> It's greater than ever. It's a better opportunity than ever to have people actually like your music. Oh, yeah. Turning that into dollars is a different game. But, you know, I think, I think that, it's, that we're in a very special time that allows us to demonstrate and reveal these diverse sides of ourselves. And in a city Completely like Houston, agree. we can have an audience for each side if we have to separate it like that. And, and it's funny because, like, you know, I, I, I do my hip-hop stuff at places, but I get booked for, like, punk shows and stuff like days and days books me for their shows even though i'm a hip-hop artist yeah and that's just because you know i do i, I guess you know I'm, I'm a pretty weird dude so and i get along with all these people and i think that even though my music is different it's still in a way like to me hip-hop used to be a form of punk rock too you know yeah. what i'm saying it, there was always political statements to it always like really angry in your face uh of course you know like as time went on people got more materialistic and all that stuff and i've always i've always talked about that how it's just kind of like it just kind of progressed from, you know, something so hardcore, I guess, to something kind of like, you know, that you just put out there to make money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we see that when, when it's gone to being played, like, regularly on the bus. It's kind of like filler material. I, I'm not trying to say that something good couldn't get out into the mainstream, but you, you made this distinction, you know, uh, as you get, as some acts have gotten gradually softer or stagnant and lost their roots whatever it might be uh and it gets just you know something turned out to because they look at it as a job now it's yeah like, exactly. it's no, I, i've expression. always said that it, if you start looking at music as a job like you're just going to start loving it yeah and yeah. Th that's how i see a lot of bands break up and a lot of people stop doing music it's because they see it as a chore like they have, like oh god i have to go play music today like i would i will never ever ever feel like that i, I don't ever want to feel like that yeah i mean you have to be in some senses you have to be professional you have to be on time you can't make commitments to band members and say all this stuff because in some sense those aspects a lot of people don't do anywhere else but their job yeah but see if you care about something it it you got to give it that same amount of effort and some of that same stuff especially when it uses other people but it's not just a it's not just toil it's not just something yeah. you got to do to make the buck. Exactly. You know? So it's it's good to hear that. Uh, I was going to ask you, um, what do you what do you think are some of the strengths of uh, Houston's music scene? Oh, just full diversity everywhere. Like that I you know, can have a show with rap. Yeah, and yeah and no, like I remember one of my first shows that I went to here was Black Christmas at Mangoes. That show had Muhammad Ali playing, had Fat Tony playing, had Black Y'all Caps with Spaces playing, and it was just such a diverse, uh, you know, group of people. There was punks hanging out and listening to hip hop, and there was like hip hoppers listening to the punk bands, and everyone was getting along, and the place was packed. Like I think that Houston itself is just a huge melting pot for music, and I, I, I never would have done any of the stuff that I'm doing now if I hadn't moved to Houston. Do you think playing uh, multi-genre shows allows uh, for people to uh, more to recognize the, your distinct craft uh, more than it would if you were on, like, say, I understand that it's a lot of fun to play, like, a genre-specific show. Because right. you get a bunch of people together. They pull from a lot of the same friends. They're like, man, I can see four or five acts that I love. Right, you know? right. But in a multi-genre show, you could be that one rap artist that they noticed or that one metal band. Exactly. I've heard people tell me. From for the community, I don't even listen to that kind of music, but I love that. And yeah. it's like, you know, the next thing you know, they're listening to it to, in front of someone else because they're yeah. like, "Oh, you like rap?" And they're playing some rap. Let's imagine it's someone who doesn't know right. rap, and then they're playing it in front of their friends, you know. And I think, 
I love that breakthrough when people like are like, oh my god, that's good, or oh my god, that it moves me some way. Whether like my to, mom listens to my music. It's, there you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> it's funny. That that all of it. <laughs> all of it. Good, yeah, trust good. me. She, my mom is actually probably the one, most supportive people I know. She but, she's like, she moved she moved me here from from Mexico on purpose. Like he, she had me in California, and then we moved to Mexico, and then she purposely was like, all right, after grade school. You're going. We're going back to the U.S. because you'll have more opportunities there. And as soon as she got, as soon as we got here, she was just like, "All right, this is where you live now. You can be whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You you can be whoever you want to be. You don't have to listen. Like I don't. You don't have to be. If you don't want to be Catholic like the rest of our family, you don't have to do that. If you don't like this kind of music, you don't have to do that. So she was just really like. I'm gonna support. She t she told me I'm gonna support you in whatever you do, no matter what. I'm really glad that you take that uh, phrase. You can do what you want, and you apply it to actually doing what you want instead of just going and instead get a of job for someone else. Exactly. Like, instead of like doing what you want, like just being reckless. I mean, like doing what you really yeah. want to do. Yeah. A lot of people either take it to just being excessively reckless, or well, what do I want to do to make the money? Those yeah, are usually exactly. what two pe Those are the routes they take it. And you've taken it more of what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to do with my creativity? What do yeah. I want to do with my time exactly. and my energy? And if more people do that and listen to their selves, they could find their true selves and actually probably succeed. You know, it just yeah, takes exactly. time and patience. I mean, you're going to work hard for the dollar. Why not work hard I for the I don't even, heart? like, I'm not going to lie. Like, And I've always stood by this. I've never made music to make money. Like, I'm... I, st yeah. I even I even make some I even make some songs that are just like super ignorant as hell <laughs> and it's just like but it's because I'm just having fun you know what I'm saying yeah. like I don't want to be super rich but not do anything with my life I want to take this music and like I want to go to Japan and and play shows over there yeah. I want to go to Spain and play shows over there I just want to like use this music as a gateway to you know traveling and adventures and yeah, all living. that cool stuff yeah. and i'm not, like since i started being a musician i can tell you i've gone through some crazy stuff that i'm like what's one of the craziest just, that you can tell us like i remember we oh yeah when i was in nine minutes at first we went to we this this thing called weed fest and it was out in the middle of the north like super like ghetto suburbs and we walk in there did you host that show, Derek? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we get there, and it's just like a bunch of huge dudes with Pantera shirts, and they're like super Southern, and they're like, just, you know, they're like good old boys, yeah, you know? Yeah. And they took us in, so like, just, they were like, oh, this is the band, this is the band right here. All right, uh, we don't have much money, but you guys can eat as much barbecue as you want, smoke as much as you want, drink as much as you want. <laughs> like, nice. And we. Had Definitely fun. did all that, you know what I'm saying? And these guys set up like a stage on property that they had in the middle of the suburban neighborhood. Very nice. It was really crazy. And like you've probably really connected with those people because a, a lived experience like that, you know what I'm saying? Like these guys are like, this is our party. This band rocks because they're not going to have a band at Dunrock at their yeah, party, you exactly. know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, it, it's important to do that over and over and over and just be open to the people, you know, and then they're open to something that's different than them. And I think that's how we tear down like all these walls between oh, people. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. It's, really, it's really awesome getting to know like people from the the whole music scene all the way from people who are DJs to people who are in punk bands to people who are like you know just doing really weird trippy stuff <laughs> yeah because we're all resources and we're also resources for art and discovery you know we're always we can and I think Houston Houston artists actually like support each other a lot I like, think it's really growing a lot more than I think it did was I mean I think it comes and goes in every scene yeah. but, but I feel like in Houston what's happening is people have known each other for a minute now and some of the people are like hey check out this new act or check out this new act or hey this venue does you right or work right. with these people or hey you can get radio everyone everyone there. like really does talk to each other like and any, any, any single time that someone's like, hey, you know, can you do this, do this for, for me, blah, 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 for the music scene? I'm like, of course, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I won't I won't not do that. Yeah, for hey, sure. Even if it's like, hey, can you share my video so people can see it? Yeah. yeah. So a lot of times it, this is something that I think is important. Uh, sometimes you got to just ask people. Yeah, people people think that like everyone's just really judgmental and like well, they no got one, a thousand things to do. I'm yeah, sure, you know, like yeah, but I think a lot of the artists in Houston, if you really talk to them, they'll promote you if you promote them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just like everyone everyone has each other's backs, and it's really cool. Even between scenes, you know what I'm saying? Like I know I know punk bands and and like metal bands that I'm friends with that promote my hip hop stuff. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And yeah, they're just like and, they're, and a lot of them don't even listen to hip hop, but. 
they listen to my music, exactly. which is really cool. Being that's just that's just straight up support. Yeah, it is. It is. And you know what's great about it is, it, well, there's a lot of things great about it. But one of the things is, you, not only are you reaching them. But that music, that style of music is reaching them. They're going to become a little bit more open to it because of you and whether they were your friends so they listened to it or, you know, they were pl- they played with you and they heard the other music and exactly. so they're like, oh, what's he do with that? Uh, and so you're expanding horizons by being so diverse. Uh, something I asked the uh, Volgernaut last time on the last episode, and I think maybe I'll keep asking this one. So we talked about a lot of great things about music scene strength and things that can be done. What What do you think could be done to make it even better? What could be done to get um, more people what, at shows? Just you, just the old school, you know, physical promotion. Always like people think that just because it's on Facebook that people are going to notice it. But, like, I, for example, every single one of my shows that I ever play, I go out of my way to print out, a shit, you know, a lot of freaking... Yeah, yeah those, <laughs> those are those 3D printed ships. A lot, a lot, yeah, it's not, it's not cheap, but it's also, like, you know, you... You want to promote, like you want to do physical stuff because people are are not going to see your flyer well, on even, Facebook all the time. I've been thinking about that. You know, Vulgar Not said the same thing, and I think that to, is to heart because it's not only music. I mean, what, the politicians they know that the number one way to get votes is to go out and shake hands, shake babies, and kiss. Right, babies, right, you know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you eat babies for breakfast. I, heard, so I, you, I, you, I, you I go do. out with them. It does say that. <laughs> it does say that on my page as a disclaimer. I do eat babies for breakfast. For sure. You got any uh, words for someone who's just getting started? I think just really go out and promote yourself and meet anybody you can. Like I, in the last three, four years, I've just been going out of my way to network as much as possible with everyone. Because I, I mean, I love people. I'm a very like I'm a people person for sure. Um, but I know sometimes it's harder for some people because they're like more introverts and they want to make music and they want to be like extravagant, but they they close themselves off. So really, it's yeah, you about you can make beautiful music in a closet that you don't share with anybody, and yeah. it could be beautiful music. But if you want music appreciation, you're gonna exactly. have to get that. You have to go out there and, and be like, here's my CD, like yeah. here's a here's a download card, here's my sticker, you know, anything because really, like you can't. You can only help yourself if you're starting out, if, especially if you're starting out by yourself. Yeah. You have to do everything by yourself because if not, I mean, no, unless you can afford to have a freaking team, which I doubt. <laughs> or find, find, you know, find out how you can be a resource to someone else. I've been thinking more and more about that because I'm going on an interview later and there's all these questions about similar things that we're talking about. And uh, one of the things I've been recently thinking is, like you said, sharing other people's videos. Be helpful, be open, you know, and you'll find these resources quicker. I've had bands that, you know, they get on my nerves sometimes. Can we get a show? Can we get a show? Can we get a show? And I'm, the other part of me is like, okay, these guys need shows. Yeah, they got, these guys yeah. want it. Yeah. Like, yeah. So uh, anything you want to, like, uh, let us know about uh, that's going on where people might be able to uh, get in touch with your music? Oh, or? yeah. Um, well, May 11th, May 11th, I'm playing... I'm playing a power violence show over at uh, White Swan with this band called Nihilist and a bunch of my friends. So if you like that stuff too, you should totally come through to that. And I know John Black is playing on Saturday for you. He booked me at Darwin's Theory for May 27th for a CD release. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. I've been yeah. actually stopping by there a few times. Darwin's uh, Theory is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool, and I love the patio. And I, uh, John's going to come on the show here and. I, I probably shouldn't say too much about it, uh, but I've heard through the grapevine that he's given Visionary Noise a uh, original song for the upcoming. Ooh, that'd be really, no, John. John is a really, really good like MC. Like I, I look up to that guy, and it's really funny because we play together and everything. And I just started talking to him the other day because. I deliver coffee in the morning for caffeine, and I and I and he works at Glaze. And I I went in there, and he he just happened to be working there. He's like, "Hey, you look familiar." And I'm like, "Dude, we've played you before." And after that, we kind of hit it off. And he was like, "Hey, I want to get you to play a show, like my CD release show." And I was like, "Way down, way down." Yeah. And then he released the the flyer for it. And it was Dar- it's a, it's a, it was Dar- Darwin's theory, and I had just started going there like last week, and nice, I think nice, it's really nice. like it's really cool because I've been going there steady now. So I, I was over there like, that uh, I, I Wednesday s- taco night. <laughs> they have Wednesday. Yeah, see, I see. <laughs> and then they got that Friday where they have music and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So I I didn't know that this place was like that cool. So. I finally went in there, and now I'm like obsessed with the place. And whenever he released the flyer, I was like super stoked. I was like, "Yeah, that's my people!" Like, there you go. <laughs> John's a good guy, and he uh, he works with a lot of people. He's very open, and I uh, yeah, because I know he, he got like uh, Jody. Yeah, he doesn't. Oh yeah, he doesn't. Um, 
he doesn't uh, back into a corner. He's like uh, we were talking, willing to mix with a lot of different people. And one of the things that he was super excited that for the community that uh, cliche was there, and I, I liked it because I'd been very appreciative of everything that John had done uh, for us uh, and respectful to him for coming through so many shows and all that. But it was really nice to see him like excited to see exactly, him, you know, and that he wasn't so beyond that, you know, it's, that he could really cool. he could like be. Oh, you gonna say he was like a boy almost? He was like, yeah. Oh yeah, no, like I can tell you, like I I go to at least like two to three shows a week, and I get excited about every single one of them yeah. because I like supporting my friends and I like supporting the bands that come through. I go to a lot of like. Um, I go to a lot of hardcore shows because there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of bands out there. But uh, I can tell you right now that I haven't seen a scene that insane. Like, I went to the show over at Black Barbie, and it was packed. It was like stepping into 1980 Minor Threat show. It was packed with kids. Everyone was moshing. Everyone was. And it's crazy because you don't see that all the time anymore. Like, you go to shows and, yeah. you know, they're okay and, or there's like nobody there. But I the can, music's going and everybody's chilling outside. Yeah, exactly. Like, we can chill in the lowdown. But at these, at these hardcore shows lately, it's like the scene is really coming back up. So it's just really cool because you see like 16 year old kids at these shows. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of them don't know about, like, 1980s, 1990s hardcore, and a lot of people are starting to play that again, which is really cool. I think, and I think Houston is the perfect place to do things like that because you can bring anything back. In I Houston. have a lot of young guys teaching me about bands that I should know about sometimes. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, exciting, you know, to just, like, see that it's a like, continuum like that because you get down sometimes. You're like, man, the way it goes, you know, this, that, or the other, whatever dark cloud. You I, I always go to every hardcore show because I know it's going to be packed every single time. And musicians love music, so yeah. there's a great start to connect with them. You know? Yeah. So uh, any last words for the listening world? Um, well, you should check me out on Facebook and SoundCloud and Reverb Nation and all that stuff. I have a lot of music on there. It's all kind of different. I never really put myself to, like, a certain label. So you're going to hear some some pretty weird stuff in there, some Spanish-speaking stuff. So. Nice, nice. I have to go through it more. I was listening to Society. I like that. Oh, it, I, that was actually with uh, some uh, words from that movie, The Network. From Viva Network. Vendetta. Oh, it was it, yeah, it was that. The, it was that uh, the the speech right before he just blows up the whole town. He's just like, because you no, know, like that that speech yeah. is like you know it hits really close to home because I feel like what he's describing and what that movie described is pretty close to what could possibly happen, and I'm like, and it's kind of scary to think about. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But yeah, it's definitely uh, thought provoking. Yeah. So, so uh, you said what? May tenth, May, uh, May 11th, May I'm playing 11th. at White Swan yeah. with uh, with a bunch of punk bands, and then. May 28th is going to be with John Black. Nice, nice. We'll make sure we mention that again because he's going to come on this. Yeah, station, John, so. John's a cool dude. So Yeah, definitely. Find uh, find uh, Worst Nightmare on SoundCloud. Uh, I found it. Type in Worst Nightmare Rapper Houston. I think uh, you can find him on Reverb Nation as well. Go ahead and like, follow, share what you like. Apparently I'm on the top way. links now. That's kind of cool. Oh, that that's important. If, if I can Google myself, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is good. <laughs> that's, that's good. That means you've been getting the work out there, other people. I Googled your name and I found like a... Uh, oh, I, I mentioned on this thing, you know, you've heard him here, you've heard him at shows, festivals, and in the local media. But one of the things that came up was a Houston Press article on you playing oh, at yeah. some festival. But uh, I was like, aha, uh-huh, <laughs> see, see, that's that's kind of part of it. After a while, a name isn't yeah. nothing because you can't it, you can Google it and find oh, exactly. well, he's done this, he's done that, you know. So it's starting to starting to. I'm pretty excited. Up. I'm really excited about like what's to come. Like this year, I, I think it's going to be a big one. Like I have this weird feeling in my bones. So I mean, I feel like this year might be. A year where you know things are going to pop off. I, as, as of yesterday, I joined an independent record label. Oh, very called good. West Made Straight Paid. They're my friends from the West Side. I've gone. I went to high school with them, and uh, you know he's. So very, he brought in some of that support. Yeah, no, yeah. So he booked me for that show yesterday, and uh, he just straight up asked me, he's like, "Would you, you know, would you be, join our label? I mean, we're independent, but you know, like." Yeah. I'm all about that. I, sure. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna expect to go straight someone... into Sony Records or some weird yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. If anything, I want to get signed by Alternative Tentacles. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Jello Biafra's fucking uh, thing. Oh. Yeah. I, uh, you know, and that's interesting because uh, these independent labels are people doing things, too. They're providing a service, you know, and it frees you up to do some other things. And, uh, you know, we talk about the uh, 
you know, vendors, merchants, uh, businesses, and everything we can that uh, needs, uh, you know, community outreach and community uh, communications here from KPFT. So definitely uh, there's record labels in Houston. There's artists in Houston. If you didn't know it, go out. Go out. To go friend. out to shows every week. Go to <laughs> at least three, and I can tell you that you're going to love it. But we're going we're gonna, to uh, wrap this up. I guess uh, I'd like to go ahead and play one other song, and then uh, we'll come, Derek and I will come back with some news. Which one uh, do you recommend over here, Jesse? Oops. Ah. Which one do you recommend here? And again, thank you all for listening to KPFT. While he picks out a song, I'll give you all the uh, necessary information. If you all want to call in, talk to us, 713-526-8737. We try to notice when that light goes off. And as I said, you've been listening to uh, Freethinker Radio with uh, Derek, Micah, and uh, Worst Nightmare. We're going to leave you with uh, this song. And then we'll be back with uh, with y'all, get some world news happening or whatever we're going to talk about. I'm not sure. I'm going to catch my breath and get some water. All right, that's that. That's that. All right, y'all enjoy this one. It's uh, Fed Up, produced by DA. Welcome to Freethinker Radio. Welcome. Welcome back. Welcome, welcome back. We just had Jesse from Worst Nightmare on. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you uh, enjoyed that, check out his music and look up him on Facebook. You can see his upcoming shows <clears throat> and what he's going to get into. We've got a little bit more news with you today. We've got 30 minutes left, and we'll be back, of course, next week. And just a reminder, all the archives for this show, they're available on KPFT's website immediately following the show, but then we post them on our Houston, our Houston Freethinkers YouTube channel uh, probably Wednesday, Thursday. And you can find all those videos, plus more, and just info about what we're doing. And if you want to find more about the Houston Freethinkers in general, go to thehoustonfreethinkers.com, and you can see all of our upcoming events. And so, soon, thanks to all the support of uh, listeners and uh, other people in the community, the show will be carried on other uh, stations as well. So if you're another station that's interested in carrying the show, um, hit us up on, on Freethinker Radio at uh, Facebook, and uh, we look forward to working with others. Absolutely. you got a couple more stories I want to get into now. Uh, this one is pretty cool. It's about Banksy, and I uh, just want to go into it just because, you know, art, music, all of it goes together, activism. And uh, it's related to his project. It's called Sirens of the Lambs, and it's designed to draw attention to the casualty, the casual cruelty of the food industry, is what it says here. An installation by street artist Banksy 
The notable project is titled Sirens of the Lambs. It made its debut in New York in 2013. Uh, but this article is saying it's still relevant. As you can view above, the slaughterhouse delivery truck carries stuffed animals or puppets, including cows, chickens, pigs, and lambs, which could be seen moving their heads through the slats. Look at this image, Mike. That's pretty funny. Um, but So they have like this slaughterhouse truck going around with all these puppet animals sticking their heads out. They, like, ah. Yeah, they look like uh, one of those uh, movies, like a Pixar movie or something. <laughs> and they got, you know, they got crazy faces. It says, the presentation wasn't just visual. The animals could be heard squealing and banging against the sides of the Farm Fresh Meats Inc. truck. Um, in April 2014, an illustration of the meat truck appeared on Banksy's website. It has been printed on canvas, T-shirts to raise uh, awareness about animal rights. So, yeah, just another way that art can be a helpful tool to spread a message, to spread awareness, whatever your message uh, may be. And we mentioned briefly earlier about uh, Tamir Rice and the settlement. I want to go just a little bit deeper into that. Um, Tamir Rice is uh, the young man who was shot by a Cleveland police officer and, you know, his name among Mike Brown, uh, Eric Garner, several others that have become kind of household names, unfortunately, over the past few years related to police violence and police shooting and the discussion behind that uh, police use of force and all that. Well, the point it's at now is that his the the police have now been ordered to pay six million dollars uh, in a settlement to his family. I don't think those police officers are going to take that money out of their pocket. And no, 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 absolutely. That's the that's the other point I want to get at here is that. So, I mean, of course, it's. It's it's pretty screwed up. I think we can all admit that somebody, a young man, I think he was 12 years old. This is the case where he was in the store with the toy gun, and they just came up pretty much immediately and just shot him. He's at a Walmart carrying around a, a toy gun. And it was actually, I think, a, um, a really cool thing to see in response to that, to see like the local Black Lives Matter movement in Cleveland, the anonymous activists, and a few other different activist groups, open carry activists. They all kind of teamed up and were just doing a lot of activism and raising awareness about <clears throat> this unfortunate case. Uh, but I wanted to to say is so you know like Micah said it's not like the tax the uh, the cops not going to get six million dollars out of his bank to pay uh, the family for this unfortunate thing the taxpayers those of you who are paying taxes in Cleveland are paying for this six million dollar settlement you know so the police kill people and then the public pays and if you look and at they also uh, use uh, taxpayer money. To make it not so bad when they kill people, they use taxpayer money to buy insurance policies, thus giving insurance companies more money in case they accidentally pop one. Absolutely. So, you know, there's all these other – I mean, this is just, again, an example that we've talked about plenty of times of one rule for them, uh, one rule for the people. But I do want to just remind you that – The people's rule. You will pay. In the Walter Scott case where the police killed a man named Walter Scott, the settlement was $6.5 million. Freddie Gray was $6.4 million. Tamir Rice was $6 million. Eric Garner was $5.9 million. So collectively, that's about uh, $25 million that the police, quote-unquote, paid out to these families. And, you know, ob- obviously I think these families deserve, deserve some kind of, you know... Um, but can you monetize a loss? Yeah, I mean, I don't really know how you put money on the loss of a life in general, but as they deserve something, right, to at least maybe compensate yeah, yeah, them for, for their sure. troubles, right? Yeah. But, the, you know, when you break it down again, though, that the police aren't taking the money out of their own pockets. They don't have a... There's no police bank, you know, where they, they're getting money for... Oh, every, anytime we kill somebody, we have this. No, the money comes out of your pocket every time And, and uh, we're you talking about taxes. three lawsuits here in Houston. Well, two in Houston, or in this local area um you know and another thing that i'd like to bring up and this is a story we'll get into later but there's a lot of suits now against cia uh, and cia is going to start paying money for torture you know so you got to ask yourself you know what is this is this like a game especially if you buy if as a city police department you buy insurance in case you accidentally go ahead and kill someone then uh well, is it like it's just a game where you know, well let's we went down five demerits there well, yeah, there's no there's no true accountability because yeah, like Micah said, if you, they're they're protected by insurance claims or they're just protected by the the blue line, you know the 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 law that protects uh, the police but leaves average citizens, um, you know, left in the dark and and to defend themselves. So it's an unfortunate situation no matter which way you look at it. This young man is dead, 2002 to 2014, 12 years old, uh, shot by police officers in Cleveland. His family's gonna get six million dollars. That six million dollars is going to come from taxpayers who, uh, whether or not they want to fund the police or fund this decision, they will continue to um, until that situation changes. How does it change? I don't know. That's a whole other conversation. But we're here to inform you, to hopefully encourage you to seek solutions and to seek new ideas that can push us past the the state of affairs that we don't appreciate. And this one, this next story here, this is some crazy stuff that I found. This story in Arizona, and I think this is probably happening more around the country than people realize. Usually. 
And this is, yeah, I know. It, this is called, uh, Why is the Federal Government Installing Mysterious Boxes on Utility Poles? Now, I wondered what was up with that. Before you get your tinfoil out, this is a real story, so don't <laughs> don't dismiss it because uh, you're like, oh, mysterious boxes. Yeah, right. I've been hearing about things like that forever. But, well, this one's pretty trippy. And so this is, happened in Phoenix in Arizona. First, we'll tell you what happened. Like a couple weeks ago, this Phoenix resident named Brian Clegg, he says, and he videotaped that he says he saw this company this truck pull up and install some box on the power line and he didn't know what it was but he had it had a little screen that he could see it was facing the direction of his house and like a high school and stuff so he was like is there a camera in there you know he kind of got concerned he didn't know what it was or who you know what the deal was he tried to contact the power provider srp is what they're called in arizona he contacted abc 15 the local news station and they looked into it and within a couple of days the bureau of alcohol tobacco and firearms and explosives also known as the atf a branch of the us department of justice acknowledged that they installed the box on also that also known as the evil overlords <laughs> they installed the box as part of an ongoing investigation officials with the atf would not provide details about their alleged investigation and they would not confirm if they were conducting surveillance in the area so this guy you know this is the other disturbing part he told the and the, the power company said they were not even aware that the box was installed so if we're to believe the power company and this man, he witnessed the ATF coming and installing this thing on the Someone else's power property. Grids. Exactly. And that's what they said. They said that the ATF has to notify them if they're going to install something on their property. The ATF, though, responded and told the ABC 15 that they can put security measures in place without asking for permission. One rule for rulers. Obviously, the federal government feels comfortable doing whatever it wants to do, whenever it wants to do. The law be damned. And another interesting part of this story, because this is something to me that's like, uh, this is why I made the tinfoil hat joke, because obviously I, I know that conspiracies exist, and all the time people conspire to do things, and that's just real life. But this one kind of takes an element of some sort of Hollywood movie out of it. Um, he says that when he saw them installing it, they came in a truck marked Field Pros. So it's like, you know, you, like and they do in Hollywood movies where it's like they're in some AC company yeah, van. Nondescript. Yeah, and they're like, oh, I'm coming to install your uh, phone service. And then they put in like a hidden listening device in your thing. So that's what it was. He said they came in there in a fake van dressed up in like a utility guy uniform that said Field Pros and went up there and installed this little surveillance box. But it was obviously an ATF agent or somebody acting under the direction of the ATF. And then the power company says, we have no idea who did that or... And this uh, reminds me of another story. You go back a couple years ago, 2013, November, Seattle residents had a similar situation where all these boxes started popping up around utility poles. And once people pushed the police for more information, they found out that the Seattle Police Department had used $2.7 million from the Department of Homeland Security to install a mesh network nodes around you know the downtown area so they could have Wi-Fi. But what they didn't know is that these nodes were able to gather people's uh, location. A Seattle newspaper wrote, How accurately can it geolocate and track the movements of your phone, laptop, or any other wireless devices? Can the network send that information to a database, um, allowing the Seattle police to reconstruct who was there any given time on any given day without a warrant? Can the network see you right now? Uh, so it caused quite a bit of uproar, and the police ultimately, they yielded to public opinion and decided the wireless mesh network will be deactivated until the city council approves a draft policy. And so far, it hasn't been, you know. doesn't mean they're not Look, doing it other if they're ways. they're not going to, like, if they're just going to go trespass and put stuff up, what makes you think they're not just going to say, yeah, we turn it off? I mean, that's, that's the problem. And then problem. sign a non-disclosure, whether it's on or off. It's the unfortunate. I can neither confirm nor deny that the death ray is on. It's the unfortunate <laughs> thing that, you know, we've done the research and looked into the Houston Police Department using the stingrays, and that's what it made me think of instantly is, like, when you're driving around the city, there's so many different light poles and things. You don't know what the heck it is. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you just sort of assume, yeah, I guess that's helping my phone or my internet. But where do you go? I mean, do you go to the base of the towers? There a number that says, curious about what this is? Give us a call. You know, there's but no way. they don't way, let you just take it off. There's no way to find out what these devices are, and I really don't think it would be that difficult. And I imagine in the future we're going to find out that there is some program, whether it's HPD or the federal government, well, that's that how they're things, literally probably installing the stingrays around that's, the That's city. how these things are. You know, if that technology is out there, chances are is not you're probably not the only community being oppressed. This is one of the things, like when the Patriot Act was first passed and all these things started going out, this money that we'd see, remember, there'd be like all of a sudden sudden tiny little town gets tank you know yeah, yeah it hap it's happened everywhere and this is um you know I, I, this article what i say is basically this is just another example of the militarization um of the police you know when you, when you put it together with drones the stingray surveillance what they call gunshot detectors which are just microphones hidden around the city that listen to your conversations automatic license plate readers fusion centers uh hpd's real-time crime center they have schools are helping police the surveillance kids, state the media police state is here you know i mean no matter which way you slice it it's already here and like Micah said the technology exists and it's the problem the double-edged sword of technology that once it's out there it's kind of hard to believe that the government said okay we won't use it anymore we promise 
Yeah. We'll, we'll get a warrant before we use it. Like, yeah. I mean, believe in really them is what that? got you in, this, in the first place. And, and again, I want to remind everybody that we, sh- we post all these articles so you can check the source material in the event. And uh, we try to tell Do you. Do your own research. This next one I'm going to talk about just briefly. Uh, one of my favorite subjects, what's happening to the kids in the schools, is from the Washington Post. So, you know, these aren't just from, like, oh, my God, I wrote this in my basement website and I hate the government. Um, so, yeah, it turns out that, you know, we, we talk a lot about what uh, happens with the uh, the police in the schools and different aspects of the schools. Well, it turns out that a school system in Orange County, uh, uh, basically where Orlando is in uh, Florida, uh, told the Orlando Sentinel uh, uh, that there's a program which partners uh, with the school system and local police departments, successful and important for protecting students' safety, says it led to 12 police investigations in the past year. School district says it paid $18,000, so was that a uh, one5 uh, okay, for each investigation, uh, $18,000 annually for uh, Snap Trends. So if y'all want to Google Snap Trends, learn more about this software, what it might be doing. It's a monitoring software used to check students' social media activity. It is the same software used by police in Racine, Wisconsin, to track criminal activity and joins a slew of other similar social media monitoring softwares available uh, and used by law enforcement to keep an eye on their community. Snap Trends collects data from public posts on students and uh, their student social media accounts. So basically, if you're a student, man, I don't know. If you got anything on public post, uh, you probably need to just change that right away. Yeah. I, I'd never even really thought about that, you know, because social media, well, I graduated in 2003, and uh, social media, MySpace thing, didn't really pick up till 2005, 2006, and definitely they weren't at the level they are now where everything you put, everybody puts everything on the Internet. So I can't even imagine what it's like to be in school where you're, like, communicating with other people via social media while at school and just how, how crazy that is. Um, but, yeah, be smart about what you're putting out there because they're watching it. For sure. They say that basically the software scans for various keywords, um, including but not limited to cyberbullying. Yeah, because I'm going to go ahead and type. I'm a cyberbully. In the middle of <laughs> cyberbullying right now. <laughs> oh, get back with me. <laughs> TTYL. <laughs> Suicide threats or criminal activity. Um, and I don't know if this is real criminal activity or the criminal activity we were speaking about earlier, like not having uh, utilities from the city on at your house. Um, school <laughs> se- security staff uh, combs through and flags posts and alerts combs. police. Yeah, combs through. They digging in your stuff, basically, in your kids' stuff. Research uh, suggests that 23% of children and teens have been cyberbullied. And this article goes on, you know, to help justify why. By this who? Happened. The teachers or the? <laughs> no, they just flat out bullied, you know. Um, Orange County Public Schools adopted Snap Trends program as part of a prevention and early intervention program. After the Newton, Connecticut school shootings in 2012, the school participated in sweeping technical review with law enforcement and state emergency experts uh, focus on safety. So, you know, as always, you know, they're going to make you safe at the expense of... Keeping you safe. Yeah. So... I've got a couple more I want to get into, if, if you, unless you got some up next, Mike. No, man. Drift through these last ones. Thank you, Jesse, for coming. Yeah. Um, we just said bye to Worst Nightmare again. Check him out. It's always fun when these uh, people come in that we talk about what's going on, and they get into the news a little bit as well. So if, this, if we ever seem preoccupied and telling them goodbye, you know why. This next one I want to cover is uh, it's a big one, and I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on it, and then uh, there's maybe one or two things I think we should mention. But I want to remind you again that we're here every Monday from 3 to 5 Central and we're also doing a lot of other things throughout the week, so if you want to follow with what we do, be sure to like Freethinker Radio, um, Visionary Noise, the Houston Freethinkers. Follow KPFT. us on Facebook, KPFT. They do a lot of good community events, you know, fundraisers and such. So stay plugged into these social networks, and you'll know what we're up to next. So what I want to talk about briefly is 9-11 and the push for these 28 pages um, to be declassified. There's just a couple of updates, Fly news out. information, and... Fly for those out. for those who followed us for a while, you you should be aware of it. But if not, just briefly, the 28 pages are a piece, a tiny piece of a congressional report <coughs> that was conducted after the uh, 9/11 attacks, and it's languished in secrecy classification for the last 15 years. Um, and for some reason, the last couple months, really the last two weeks, all of a sudden the media wants to talk about these 28 pages that everyone else has been trying to get them to talk about for a while. And it seems to be happening at a very unique time whenever the United States' relationship with Saudi Arabia is strained, or at least on the surface it's appearing to be strained. Um, <clears throat> the Saudi kingdom has made threats to liquidate nearly uh, $750 billion worth of U.S. Good. assets if you know the U.S. pursues a bill. There's a bill that's basically in Congress right now 
that would now this is just crazy to me itself that okay even though people know that most of the hijackers came from Saudi Arabia at least that's what we're told and there's some evidence of funding that the country the kingdom is you know they're they're immune to any sort of lawsuit so the families have tried to sue them in the past the 911 family members and they've been unsuccessful at it so they're trying to get a bill passed which would say that anyone who is connected to financing no matter who what country they have to pass a bill to say this <laughs> Uh, any country that you know is re- related, to, connected to funding terrorism, can be pursued in the court of law. So, in response to that, Saudi Arabia is like, "You better not go after that. We're going to liquidate all this money, and we're going to cause all sorts of problems." People are speculating on whether or not the Saudis could and would actually do that, or if it would hurt them in the long run. And then, all of a sudden, these people who've been so silent for the last 15 years, different people. I will say, Senator Bob Graham, he's spoken out about it for a while, but now all of a sudden, like the uh, people in the past who've said that they were. Um, stifled and stuff. They're coming out in support of these 28 pages. And myself and I think many other 9-11 researchers think that it's a positive thing to see that, okay, well, 9-11 and questioning the official story is in the mainstream. It, they're being talked about, right? That there's a story different than what we were told. Maybe it involves the Saudis. Um, but others are saying that we got to be careful with this because I and I asked the question, why is it that all of a sudden after so long that the media – Again, that we all know the five corporations run things. You know, they run the meet the for major, the ball, most part. Yes. They run the major, other than outlets like ours here. You know, there's a and the internet, of course, has revolutionized that. But the big five corporate outlets that you know most of us would see or hear on TV or radio, they look different, but they're the same. They're, this, they're different. You know, it's Coke and Pepsi, and we all know that it's a, it's a big charade. You know, so um, why would they all of a sudden choose to? And this is something I, I personally pay attention to. Whenever these various media outlets, they're all talking about the same thing this week. You know, it's like this week's episode is. Focus on this distraction. Focus on be be offended by this, you know. And when that happens, I I really get weary. Like, okay, what's going on? So it's not that I don't think we should be supportive of uh, uncovering more truth about 9/11 and definitely pointing the finger at the Saudis. But there's certain things, and I'm just going to throw these out without getting too deep. That there's hundreds of accounts from firemen and other people who were there who heard explosions before the planes the the buildings collapsed. And I don't think the Saudis had the ability the ability to go into the buildings. Or, and if they did have access, then that's some incredible access. We need to ask that question. Could the Saudis uh, get bombs inside the buildings? Could the Saudis, who have it has been confirmed and reported that NORAD had to stand down for a certain amount of time, did the Saudis order that? I think that there's obviously has to be some sort of, I don't know how else to put it other than influence from within the U.S. government, elements of the U.S. government. I don't know. I know it's a controversial opinion. I'm just saying in our pursuit of truth about 9-11, we shouldn't let the media – you know, decide where we stop and where where our pursuit ends. Yeah, we shouldn't limit the dialogue ever to what they say. Just Absolutely. remember that there's a lot more stuff out there, and don't just, just settle, 28 pages. And don't and see just where settle for the lazy media. Get in that reading media. I know we're getting uh, we're we're getting towards the end. I I got some headlines, and I'm going to drop these articles in there because I don't know that I have enough time to go into detail. But I'm going to notice a theme on a few of these. It's uh, this is from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. It turns out that it's revealed the boom and bust of the CIA's secret torture sites. You know, you may have heard us. Talking about these black sites over the last four, how long have we been around on this show? Four years? Four years. Yeah. Um, this goes into a little bit more detail. I, I, I don't want to go into all this dark stuff right before we leave. <laughs> uh, the next one. The sun shining. Well, you know, that the fact that it's coming to light. And, it's a good thing. Yes, and so many of us have known things about, you know, what's going on with this and get little pieces. Another article that's out there is the CIA queen of torture, um, this individual in Germany. This is a very interesting story, uh, um, helped uh, operate um, a site there in Germany, uh, and there's a human rights group in Germany that's filed a complaint in their federal court against Alfreda Francis Bikowski, CIA agent known as the queen of torture. Um, this one, This one's long, and, you, you know... I, I'd love for y'all to get into it. Um, and uh, one more CIA. You notice this? We're kind of on a CIA rant. What else has happened today? A bunch of talking about suing, right? Well, CIA psychologists, it turns out, can be sued for creating torture program, according to a judge. Two CIA psychologists who devised a program of enhanced interrogation, including waterboard, rectal feeding, and other things. Um, secret prisons are getting sued for the first time in the United States. A civil lawsuit alleges that two CIA contract psychologists devised torture methods against three former detainees at secret prisons in the early 2000s. The alleged victims are now claiming damages. In a ruling from the bench at Federal District Court, Spokane, Washington, senior judge Justin Quacken Bush said that he would deny a motion to dismiss a lawsuit uh, um, against James E. Mitchell and uh, Bruce Jessen. Plaintiffs include uh, Mohammed Ahmed bin Saad, a Libyan who was arrested, held in the secret Afghan prison um, where he was tortured, continued to suffer deep psychological harm. 
Um, and I won't go into this. The, the torture is just horrible, the details of it. But it turns out that they're going to court. So at least someone's going to have a day in court with that. And I'll give you two more things, and then I'll just kind of be quiet. University of Ho- Florida is holding their first brain-powered drone race. Don't know if you all saw this from Vice.com or not. But, you know, no longer will we have to er- worry as much about eye-hand coordination. Let's just take that old hand right on in there, out of there. And get these uh, drones operating a little bit more efficiently. So, <laughs> all those things will be in there. And I think I think I got one. Well, I had a few more, man. Check out the Freethinker Radio page itself. It's uh, yeah. Check out Freethinker Radio Facebook page. And if you want to find our event, it just says Freethinker Radio featuring Worst Nightmare. And there's a thread. We've got all the articles we've covered today. I'm going to mention two more things, and then I think we'll wrap up with some music. Just I, I just feel like we couldn't go today without uh, mentioning the fact that. Uh, President Obama announced that they were sending more troops to Syria, and this is, of course, just a continuation of of further lying and just uh, advancing, you know, the the wars. It was so good the first time they got to go back again. And, you know, this, and you know, we we make light of a lot of situations here because you know we got you can't let the heaviness weigh you down. You got to float above it. We, you know, you keep fighting the good fight. You can't let yourself get war down. But you also understand the severity of the situations. And you know, I'm looking at two different stories here. Right? It says. Obama boosts Islamic State fight. He asked Europe to do the same. On Monday, he cast his decision to send 250 more troops to Syria as a bid to, quote, keep up momentum in the campaign to dislo- dislodge the Islamic State extremists. Then one tab over, I'm looking at his story, he says, uh, the U.S. Pentagon confirms more civilian deaths in their you know, war against ISIS, their war against, and this is in Syria and Iraq, U.S. airstrikes aimed at the Islamic State, the same one that Obama just said we need to continue to fight. Um, has killed 20 civilians between September and February, including eight in a single attack. And, of course, this is the only the ones that the U.S. military is willing to acknowledge. We should absolutely assume that the numbers are much higher than this, uh, without a doubt, because, you know, for, even though the media tried to ignore it, if you go How back, many things in your life did you find out 15 years later when you knew back then this was going on, you know, when a few people said something or you said something, and then when it comes out, it's much much worse, whether we're talking about this um, conspiracy by Goldman Sachs or this the corruption by Chase or the murdering in the wars. Absolutely, you know, and so it's important just to be skeptical of these sources. This is These are New York Times and Associated Press. They have a long history of... Uh, being reputable, et cetera, but they also have a long history of, and I, I wrote about this last month, being Associated complicit. Press. They made a deal with the Nazis uh, during you know, the, the rise of Hitler. They basically said that they were the only outlet to have access to Nazi Germany. All other outlets had been kicked out. And then just a couple months ago, like about a month ago, and this lady found an old document that confirmed that the Associated Press made deals with Hitler to not run certain stories and to give them a favorable light to have that press access. So my, I say that just to say that you know all sources should be questions, and especially when the U.S. military says something, like, hey, we acknowledge we killed 20 people in six months, period. Oh, they're like, well, I guess that's an acceptable number. They probably ran some studies and said, oh, well, if it's only two per month or two in this time period, people won't be too upset. They won't be moved to action. But, you know, if we keep it below this level, so let's keep our numbers down below there. But if you know um, about the drone papers, and if not, and if you don't, you know, don't really feel bad about it, but please do go Google because the reason I say don't feel bad is because the media did a great job of keeping it out of uh, the conversation. But Google, the drone papers, came out last year, and that whistleblower, the documents that he released, show that the U.S. Um, misses targets 90% of the times, that the targets usually typically involve civilian deaths of people that are unrelated to their uh, their target. So I would say that the numbers um, are probably much higher than just 20 people in a matter of six months, unfortunately. And that war will drag on and continue. I don't know, again, what's the solution. Maybe if we went back to 2003 and people marched in the streets again, maybe if we get a a worse president, people will march again, and that will have an effect. I don't really know. I think that there's probably better solutions within our own communities. There's other ways for us to, you know, stop, start removing our support for these people, both moral, financial, otherwise. But hopefully you guys can find the solutions on your own. The last thing I have is just a a, a nice story about acid, LSD. (laughs) And it's a mind-expanding story. I figure it's a good way to end. Um, But a new study published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences has shown what exactly happens in the human brain during visual hallucinations caused by LSD. And this has never before been done. They were able to map brain uh, scanning techniques and show how, in 20 volunteers, how their brain literally responds. And they've shown now, visually being able to show, what many of us have known for, I think, well, as, lo- as long as you've ever tried uh, psychedelics, is that you have access to other parts of your brain, and this has now been proven scientifically that there are very there are b- various barriers in your brain and the way that it works that are up. But whenever you are under the influence of that, those barriers break down, and you can uh, have access to different modes of thinking. Maybe your whole mind is communicating with itself. 
Yeah, and they said also that it, they they were able to cr- visualize what an ego dissolution looks like in the brain or an ego death. Some people are familiar with that sort of experience. But also, this is another last thing I want to say. This is from the main uh, researcher. In many ways, the brain in the LSD state resembles the state of our brains when we are infants, free and unconstrained. This also makes sense when we consider the hyper-emotional and imaginative nature of an infant's mind. So kids are tripping all the time, and when you're tripping, you're basically back to your inner child. Well, one thing I can <laughs> say is I went to uh, – one of the things I focused on in grad school was uh, neuroscience, and it has been ju- uh, just – Wonders, wonders uh, have been coming from it, and it's really kind of an interdisciplinary study, even though, you know, there's biologists and uh, uh, medical doctors and uh, uh, other people like that. There's also philosophers, you know, like what is cause? When you start talking about a brain, you know, what is cause? All these things, and it's a ripe field, so if it's something you're into, you know, um, these people, it's great that they're actually doing some real research to get the facts out, because as as our ability to study things scientifically changes, so does our understanding of what is really a fact um, absolutely check it out that's that definitely some interesting stuff to look into thank you guys for listening today you've been listening to freethinker radio on 90.1 kpft on the hd3 dial we want to ask you to check us out again next monday same time same channel as always you are beautiful you are free <laughs>